during the 1980s, there was a group of boys who took skateboarding from a regional popularity to renowned heights. We're talking about the likes of Tony Hawk, Lance Mountain, and Steve Caballero. But what if I told you that one of those kids that helped bring skateboarding to its heights also ended up throwing it all away with one fatal mistake? That guy is Mark Gator Rogowski. Let's talk about it. I'm off ahead, so I guess I'm labeled a head hunter. Throw me on the verse, and I promise you probably last longer. Moving through the masses, I'm crashing the main circuit. Too bad, because I had the plans to be modest, remain close. Mark Rogowski was born on August 10, 1966 in Brooklyn, New York, but after his parents divorced when he was just three years old, he moved to Escondido, California with his older brother and mother. He was always an athletic kid growing up, playing little league baseball and surfing, but it was skateboarding that captured his love when he was just seven years of age. He was also seen as an outcast because his family didn't have the money that his friends had. In fact, his friends were into surfing, not skateboarding. By the time he hit the age of 12, after just two years of skating locally, he was picked up by a local skate team. And that's when his career really started to take off. Skateboarding at this time was still trying to find its groove and it would do just that when the 80s rolled around. In 1980, when Gator was just 14, he turned pro. And in 1982, he finally won his first major contest at the Canadian Amateur Skateboarding Championships. By 1984, he had racked up endorsements and wins, and this led to him becoming the first skateboarder to receive his own pro deck by Vision Sports, which became a very popular seller. There were only a handful of pro skaters at this time, and Mark was one of them, setting the stage for the major rise in skateboarding as a sport. He did have a run-in with the police in 1986 during the Mount Trashmore event where he punched a cop in the face in the parking lot. The cops ended up letting him off without issue because the law enforcement felt that their own guys were being a little bit too pushy. Rogowski had grown so popular that he secured a major deal with Vision in 1987 to use his name on their merchandise. The company sold around 7,000 decks per month including videos, stickers, and clothing which would earn Gator around $14,000 per month. He, along with Christian Hosoy, Tony Hawk, Lance Mountain, and Steve Caballero revolutionized the sport, particularly vert skateboard. What helped skateboarding's popularity explode in the 80s was the introduction of skate videos, giving young kids and teens the opportunity to spend hours watching their favorite skaters. Mark was known as a rebel and a cool kid out of all of the most famous guys, which is mainly what attracted so many people to him, outside of his abilities. In that same year, Mark was at a skate show in Scottsdale, Arizona, where he met a pair of 17-year-old friends, Brandy McLean and Jessica Bergston, an aspiring model. During that entire weekend, Gator and Brandy partied the entire time together and ended up falling for one another. He would call her and send her love letters from San Diego to Arizona on a daily basis, and a few months later, she moved in with him. Now, while the vision deal gave him his popularity, a large segment of the skater community felt like he was a sellout and hated the commercials that he would do. He was dancing, wearing weird outfits, totally going against the rebel image that he had built and one that the community admired him for. And this is also where Gator began the downslide going into the 90s. Vision Sports signed talented vert skateboarders, which is what made skateboarding what it was in the 1980s. But in the 90s, skateboarding reinvented itself and it moved into what is called street skating. This style took over skateboarding because skate parks were being closed down, so the kids took it to the streets. The vert skaters went from being loved and at the top of the food chain to nothing. Gator went into crisis mode, losing his identity and trying to understand how he fell from grace. He wasn't a good street skater and kids would even laugh at him when he would try. It got really bad for him during these days, but things would begin to get even worse. He became really aggressive to everyone that was around him, including the new trainer he had hired to help him get his physique and wellness in tip-top shape. One day in Australia, after doing a bunch of demos, a kid came up to him asking him for an autograph, and Mark hauled off and hit him in front of a bunch of people. His sales in Australia after this incident began to tank. During this time, it became very apparent to everyone around him that he had a huge rage issue and it had never been addressed. That rage issue more than likely stemmed from his absentee father, a man who had also had uncontrollable rage issues. On top of that, he had a drinking problem. In one instance in 1990, he and his Vision Sports crew were visiting Germany during a World Cup event. And one night, Mark got entirely too drunk, climbed up a construction crane and jumped and landed on the fence, leaking blood everywhere. His friends say that he was leaking blood so bad that it sounded like someone was pouring soda out of a soda can. That's how much his blood was spilling out of him. The next morning after waking up in the hospital, he didn't even realize what had happened the night before. From then on, he decided to try and get his life together. What did he do? Well, he did what many people would do. 
who were lost and searching for something. He attempted to turn his life to God. Now, with Mark's newfound born-again Christian life transformation, which none of the people closest to him believed, he also wanted his girlfriend Brandy to join him. She refused and said it didn't fit her life, so she left him and found another guy. And of course, what follows next is Gator being extremely jealous. It got so bad that he started to stalk her and the new guy, even going as far as following her to the man's house one day and calling his phone. He then broke into Brandy's parents' home and stole back everything that he had ever gotten her, including the car that he bought her. One of the last things that he had ever told Brandy was that he should kidnap her, commit every sex act to her body, and dump her new body in the desert. After that, she had to go into hiding from him. At this point, you could see that there was a chemical imbalance with Bogowski. To make those types of statements to anybody screams not well. A guy who had never been turned down by a woman in his life was slapped in the face with constant rejection for the first time ever. But there's more. Remember Brandy's friend Jessica that I said he met along with Brandy when they first encountered one another? Well, he actually ended up with Jessica one night to hurt Brandy. And it wasn't just to hurt Brandy by being with Jessica. The goal was to inflict pain unto Brandy by inflicting pain unto Jessica. So, here's what happened. In 1991, they met up one day for lunch. Then they ended up at Mark's house afterwards in Carlsbad, California. Jessica wanted to entice him and he ended up drinking some wine, which he hadn't done in quite some time. Around 2.30 a.m., he snapped. With so much hate, depression, and rage, wanting to get back at Brandy for leaving him, he beat Jessica in the head with a club that you used to secure a steering wheel. After realizing she was still a bit conscious, he took her to the bedroom in his condo handcuffed her to the bed and proceeds to essay her for about three hours, nonstop. After the three hours were over, he felt like she was making too much noise and didn't want the neighbors to hear her cries and yelling, so he zipped her up inside of a surfboard bag and proceeds to strangle her while she's inside of said bag. He then buried her body in a riverbed, and when she was discovered by a young boy riding on the bicycle after Jessica had been reported missing, her body was completely decomposed due to the elements of the desert and completely unrecognizable. Now, when Gator turned himself in, he said that he and Jessica just had a night of kinky sex that went bad. He tried to convince all of his peers around him that everything would come out in his favor during the trial, not taking accountability for what he had done. Mind you, what he had done to Jessica is exactly what he told Brandy that he would do to her in some of his last words to Brandy before she went into hiding from him. And get this, he went to Brandy's home about a week prior to the incident that happened with Jessica with the goal of murdering Brandy. But she wasn't home when he knocked on the door. Everything that he had hated about Brandy, he hated about Jessica. From looks to personality, they were so tied in with one another and it made Mark sick to his stomach. During the trial, he actually pled guilty to the crimes he committed and apologized for not holding himself accountable for the disgusting act. He was sentenced to 31 years to life in prison after escaping the death penalty. Now, when he turned himself in, he was actually diagnosed as manic depressive. That's no excuse for what he did, but if you have listened or watched any of the previous stories that I have done on these athletes that committed terrible crimes, they almost always had a chemical imbalance in their brain. In my opinion, he definitely deserved a harsh sentence, but if he would have gotten the help that he knew he needed, and yes, he admitted that he knew he needed help from a psychologist, it more than likely could have prevented this incident from occurring. You see, this happens a lot with young icons. They are given everything and boasted up so high as kids, then once their fame slows down and it all gets taken away from them, they can't transition. Brain not fully developed can't handle what life is going to be like after the highs turns into lows. In December of 2019, Rogowski was paroled by the parole board and set for release, but just four months later, California Governor Gavin Newsom reversed it and forced him to start the parole process all over again. Then in June of 2022, he was paroled again, and five months later, Governor Newsom rescinded the granted parole yet again. What was the reason this time? He had gotten into a verbal disagreement with another prisoner and showed an inability to understand what caused him to act in a violent way. At this time, there is no release date set for Mark, and that's such a sad shame. And that's the story of the rise and fall of Mark Gator Rogowski. Y'all be easy.
I'm off ahead, so I guess I'm labeled a headhunter. Throw me on the verse, and I promise you probably last longer. Moving through the masses, I'm crashing the main circuit. Too bad, cause I had the plans to be modest, remain close.